three years ago, I would have said that health is probably 80% exercise, 20% nutrition. Based on what I now know, I actually believe it's the other way around. Throw away the bread and you've got a much better chance. Galera Cardo, Park O'Clock again, will clear her clear of my head in the bell with her Kiri Agason Dawn. Agas not stoy to take a With the red and the black flags of County Down, as Kevin Musson led the men from morn onto the field to play their first senior All Island West. Every young fella's dad is his hero. And my, my dad was a big, you know, football star in his day. Lean, fit, healthy, never drank. Made to do these other tests as well. And boom, heart attack. That was in, that was in the sports centre in Yerry. It surprised us all. Paddy kicks over to Sean O'Neill. Another goal. Down's great fight back puts them in the lead. My uncle was regarded as, as one of the greatest players ever to play Gaelic football. And Sean, and that's Sean beside me, the two of us together here. He was uh, discovered to have the condition of type 2 diabetes. He burst his way through, but he hits the post. These men were elite sportsmen. They were incredibly fit. Everything that you would associate with, you know, vibrant health, they had it. And then further down the line, these illnesses emerge. So you have to question what the hell happened there. The USDA, the AHA and the AMA came out and said, we need to reduce our consumption of fat to prevent heart disease, right? Has it worked? Disaster. Unfortunately, there are more and more people that are getting diabetes, so it is it's unfortunately a fantastic business outlook. New research coming out of some of America's most respected institutions is starting to find that sugar is a toxin. I was conditioned like everybody else to believe certain things. I found out that a lot of what I thought I knew was what you can only describe as lies. Scotland. The base of the pyramid would be mostly your carbohydrate foods, which is your breads, your cereals, your vegetables and your fruits. Proteins, dairy products. And in the very apex of the pyramid would be your fats and your oils. So this is your typical average healthy diet. And I'm saying standard medical opinion and standard government advice is not where I'm looking for solutions anymore. I want to see if I can hack my genes. So for 28 days, I'm going to completely disregard the food pyramid. No wheat, no sugar. I'm going to gorge on fat. And I'm going to see what happens. So this is the uh, Sports Institute of South Africa. In terms of health and wellness, Cape Town is one of the most advanced societies I've ever seen. Under the guidance of Professor Tim Noakes, I'm going to use medicine and medical tools to see the impact of the food plan. So I'm responsible for writing all this and I don't believe it anymore. Any practicing medical doctors believe that what they were taught 30 years ago is still going to be valid today. And the concept that knowledge changes is not something that they weren't taught. So yes, it's very unusual for someone to go completely against the medical advice and to go onto a high fat diet and expect to, to benefit from that because we've been taught the exact opposite. Hi, I'm Dr. Prinsley. Nice to see you. Hi, you too. Should we go on through? Please. In terms of an average patient that, that you would see, I'm probably not the norm. Coming from a, a family of lean athletes who have gone on to develop type 2 diabetes, 
cardiovascular disease. I'm looking for an intervention mm -hmm. that I'd like to drop dead healthy. So at the moment there's debate about how much fat should one have, how much protein should one have. But there are risks, so I think it's very important that it needs to be medically supervised. High fat intake um, will have an impact on your cholesterol. God bless your steady hand. As you're eating more protein, it can possibly cause damage to the kidneys. So we'll see what, how does your body change as you shift from eating more carbs to eating more fats. Great. Coming over here for your heart, so standing with your back against the ruler over here, please. Um, your body fat percentage is 13.6. Let's take these off. So this big contraption over here is called a metabolic chamber. And what happens is we put our patients in here for 24 hours, and what we do is we measure their oxygen um, consumption and their carbon dioxide production. And from that, we can determine how many calories you should consume throughout the day. Is there an alternative? Your fat percentage is at 13.6%. So that's, that's excellent. So you're already starting with good, with good measurements. Your kidneys are working absolutely fine. Okay. Um, so we don't need to be anxious about that. Cholesterol, this is where it starts getting interesting. So first we look at total cholesterol, and yours is high. High cholesterol has been shown to be a cardiovascular risk. So this is something we're gonna need to watch as you're having a high fat diet. And with your, with your family history of your father having cardiovascular disease, I'd recommend that you get a DNA test. So this is the first shot for the start of the food plan. So these are my secret weapon, uh, macadamia nuts. They're about 80% fat. I reckon macadamias will probably account for 30% of my total calorific intake. It's some frozen mixed berries. Uh, berries are very low in sugar. A nice leg of lamb. So I'll be eating uh, probably four to 500 grams of meat a day. Of course, eggs. Any research that I've done on eggs is resoundingly positive, and an egg is almost perfect food. I think the, um, the cereal companies probably pushed them off the breakfast plate. We eat them between 20 to 25 a week. Say that, like, you're an extremist. Why? <laughs> um, I'm inquisitive. There's a difference. If it was an extremist, I would take something and stick to it. But if the results give me what I want, I'll continue in that path. If they don't, you keep looking. I've always had a very healthy disregard for medical opinion and that goes back to when I was 10 years old. I was misdiagnosed uh, with a very serious back injury. My mum took me to see a gentleman who was a top orthopaedic surgeon. He missed it. Fast forward seven years later, I just won my first international vest for Ireland. I was a high jumper. And that injury that was there, that was misdiagnosed, ultimately led to the end of my career. I was angry for a long time. And since that day, I will never take medical opinion on board without a degree of skepticism. This is 
is the Saturday market where all the artisan food manufacturers come together. It's somewhere that I can eat freely when I'm uh, following the, the food plan that I'm on. There he is. Obviously there's a, an opinion that cheese is possibly bad for you. Do people ever ask you if it's healthy? The only cheese that's really healthier is goat's cheese. I mean it's a low fat cheese, so it's the healthier option. But Because it's lower fat? It's lower fat. This is 2%, yes. this is low fat. Low. Do you find that's what people are looking for? Absolutely. The healthier the better. So you think 2% is healthier than? Oh yeah, I think so. Okay. The majority of people think so. One of the first things they used to say if you had heart disease was no fat. Mm. And of course that was completely wrong because you need the good fats. I, I always think about macadamia nuts as being nature's vitamin pill because they have such terrific uh, medicinal benefits. Yes. All the um, anti-inflammatory benefits, palmitoleic lake acid, you know, all these qualities are enormous and, and the list of, of vitamins is huge. Unfortunately, they haven't been well exposed, but there again, we have a great product. So I think it's just a matter of time before the truth comes out. <laughs> There's a whole realization that many of the nutrients in our diet can't be digested unless we have fat present in the diet at the same time. For example, full cream milk is much more healthy for you than skim milk because it contains the, the vitamins which can be absorbed when they're in present with the fat. Fats, in fact, are very important components of the cell structure. They're part of the membranes. A lot of communication happens through those fatty layers. They've actually got a far more integrated metabolic function. So it's a very exciting area of study. <laughs> If we told you that was actually extremely healthy for you, would you believe us? Um, not initially, unless you could prove it. <laughs> but is it really healthy? You need to talk to this guy. For a four week period, I'm not eating any wheat or sugar, and I'm certainly not touching any bread. Then you're not enjoying the fullness of the food groups. Four plus oh, four is eight. Sugar in that. Sure. <laughs> For a four week period I've been eating, I'm eating about 20-25 eggs a week, a kilo of macadamia nuts, probably three kilos of meat and bacon, uh, full fat Greek yogurt, berries. I've cut out wheat and sugar. Okay. How does that sound to a super chef like yourself? Uh, it sounds like you need to eat a little bit more what you are eating. <laughs> <laughs> That no, no, makes perfect sense. A lot of people are going the way of, the way of protein. Yeah. Um, it makes perfect sense. I'm going the way of fat. Fat also works. Yeah. Yeah, fat's good. Fat's good. I think we've, we've been lied to about cholesterol for a long time. People don't understand how it works. I think there's there's, there's magic in fat. Mm -hmm. You think I'm insane? Don't clean up well. Why? Well, because you need everything. But balance. Lunch and food for the class and team building. Of course he is. He, does. he knows that. Come on, he knows that. You know. I think the food pyramid is a, a disaster, really. It's really based on the principle that the diet should be very carbohydrate rich and relatively low in fat. Okay. And actually, we know a lot of that just isn't true now. interesting is subsequent to those American guidelines which came out in the 70s, the average consumer is eating less uh, fat in their diet, they are eating uh, more carbohydrate in the diet and we've got rampant increases in obesity, diabetes, heart disease. The body should have been able to regulate that and burn it off 
wastefully. It should have been an easier model for public health uh, to manage. But as you just said, the evidence is quite to the contrary. Up to 1959, everyone knew that carbohydrates made you fat. The high carbohydrate diet came in, obviously, as a result of Ansel Keys and the lipophobia that he generated. The fear that fat was the cause of heart disease. Six countries have been used to produce uh, this study. That original work showed an association between you know, the amount of saturated fat consumed in some countries, but when you look more widely, uh, it turns out that uh, the association just really wasn't there, or it was significantly weakened. Ansel Keys manipulated the data and chose six countries where there was a linear relationship between increasing fat in a diet and the increasing rate of heart disease. And unfortunately, he deleted 16 countries, and if you add those 16 countries, there is no relationship. Now the science is clear that there is absolutely no evidence that saturated fat is the primary or even an important cause of ill health. So the lipophobia took off, and it's going to take a long time to change that. And so we went from eating these really good sources of protein and fat to this rubbish cereals, which has got no nutrient value whatsoever. Everyone has continued to restate what, what Keyes said in, in the 1970s, but, but he was completely wrong. This is the uh, official United States Department of Agriculture nutrition website. So the idea is that you can track your intake of uh, the recommended daily allowances for various food groups. This would be based on the food pyramid the standard food permit, which um, I completely disregard. It'll be very interesting to see what my fat intake does to uh, a system like this when it comes to analysis. Great sandwich bar, but they also do great salads. No croutons, of course. The jogging epidemic that hit the US in the 70s and 80s was incredibly damaging to hips, to knees, and to hearts for that matter. This is how I'm training at the moment. I find the short and tense training techniques are much more effective. One and a half minutes of effort. Oh. And when you do that, you get a, a really fantastic aerobic and anaerobic response. I woke up this morning, I was kind of sleeping like that, and I noticed a bit of a hum, and I think it might be this uh, ketone whiff that they talk about. I think I may have officially switched to fat burning mode as of the last 24 hours. So you think you stink? I think I probably do. Okay, 70.6. Wow, that's dropped a bit since the last time, eh? So it mm. dropped 1.3 kilograms in a week. Have you changed your exercise plan? Have you been exercising a lot in the last um, that's a bit of a surprise, actually. I've, I've exercised for all of eight minutes. Um, the 1.3 uh, kilograms is quite a big uh, drop to, to make in a week. See, how, see if it stabilizes yeah. in the weeks to come. Okay. Part of the lipophobia problem is that we believe that fat makes us fat, and it's the exact opposite. The more fat you eat, the thinner you become. Most of our 
eating is driven by addiction, a craving. And once I started eating a high-fat diet, I've got real hunger, which is something that occurs every 12 to 24 hours. So I think that the addictive foods that the industry has developed in the last 20 years are the drivers of obesity and, and probably heart disease. And it's the sugar that is highly addictive. Association, the American Medical Association, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture admonished us to reduce our total fat consumption from 40 to 30 percent. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, cardiovascular disease, stroke, all jacked way up as our total fat consumption has gone down. It ain't the fat, people. It ain't the fat. I think we're beginning to recognize that probably sugar is more toxic uh, than we perhaps first realized. And it's been, for example, recently heavily implicated in heart disease, whereas before it was always fat. Yudkin was correct, but he had to be demonized because he was drawing attention to sugar and sugar industry was really just taking off. And there's no room for eating refined foods because they're just designed for shelf life and to make you addicted. And industry knows that. Typical supermarket layout. The refined foods hit you from every direction. Oh, here we go. It's a flavoured milk. Very high in sugar. Now, this is uh, aimed directly at slimmers. And the second ingredient in that is sugar. Dried fruit. This is nearly 50 grams of sugar per 100 grams. Reduced fat mayonnaise. Sugar is the third ingredient. As soon as you take fat out of the food, it becomes impalatable, it becomes like cardboard, so they have to replace it with something, and so they found that sugar or high fructose corn syrup was the ideal. So no one should be eating low-fat foods. A potential vested interest in the idea that, you know, carbohydrate is great and fat is bad. I mean, if nothing else, it gives the food industry the opportunity to churn out supposedly healthy foods that are low in fat that actually uh, are far from healthy uh, and then can sell people grain-based foods that are cheap to produce and have good markup. You know, there's a lot of money to be made. This whey protein is uh, it's actually very difficult to find, just pure whey. 100% whey protein, stabilizers, sweeteners, sucralose, and a bunch of other stuff I can't even pronounce. So they take something perfectly natural like this one, mix in a bunch of other stuff and it becomes something different. Organically grown chocolate balls. I, I don't even know what that means. I'd love to know where these chocolate balls grow. They use terms like sugar cane to make it sound better than it actually is, but are you kidding? People are acting with the best of intentions, but they, they are being misled. As a guy who works in the advertising business, a client comes to me with a product and tells me what that product does that will be beneficial. And I need to dress that in a way that will engage the potential customer. Advertising can change behavior. And we can create fear, we can create joy, we can create things that are triggers that cause changes in behavior. I mean, special K was a way of losing weight. Um, what constitutes misleading is, I think, what you're asking. And I think the problem is people sort of pick on the advertising. And I would say that public relations is a far bigger influence on what people consume than how much they're advertised. I always say to clients, why pay to advertise? Why would you want to spend thousands of pounds advertising when actually what we have to do is do something to attract the media's attention? With a really good story, you can get in there and be the page lead with a big picture for free. There are a few questionable practices and some of them you can see through and some of them you can't. I mean, clearly companies can commission scientific reviews, so-called scientific reviews. And that's an old PR trick uh, where you can get a, a friendly academic that can write something that supports your cause and then you submit that to the press as the truth.
lot of PR agencies do take their clients on trust. So if something comes along, like a report or whatever it is, it's their job to just get it out. They kind of get caught up in the, the busyness, the delivery. I like and be halfway around their world before the truth's even got its boots on. Public relations is about try and make people think differently about X situation. And you can see the money that these companies around the world spend or to to make the agenda and the environment more favorable to the products that they're selling. And then lobbying goes even further. Lobbying is about going into government and changing the agenda that's out there. And uh, that's all behind the scenes. And lobbying is, is one of the areas that's very under the counter. We don't see it. I certainly never see it in the advertising side of the equation, but I know it's there. America recently, you know, a um, the tomato covering on a pizza is considered a vegetable serving. So suddenly pizza in school can be considered a vegetable. You know, looking at, at that business, oh, I'm not going to use the word evil, but there's a lot more kind of, there's a lot of other stuff going on there. Chicken breast. I'm just about to complete the lunch input and you can tell that I'm already before I even get to dinner, I'm already in excess of the protein allocation for somebody consuming 2,800 calories a day. Again, it only goes up to 8 ounces, and I had about uh, 12 ounces, so I'm going to have to put this in twice. I haven't put the eggs in yet. No. So we're coming in around 3,500 calories. Protein is very, very high, 423%. 74 grams of saturated fat. The fat is the big one. I've eaten 74 grams against a recommended daily intake of 31 grams. I'm getting red flags everywhere here. And these are actually uh, warning signs. And this is the US government's food guidelines. that red meat is bad has been around for so long and it's been hammered pretty hard so it's in the back of my mind somewhere that it possibly isn't very healthy it's a bit like Catholic guilt following you around but it's, it just shows you how strong the uh, messages can be what theoretically would be the best diet for us as a species and you could argue a diet based on foods we've been eating a long time. Because the vast majority of our time we've been hunter-gatherers, we think, and what do hunters and gatherers eat? Well, hunted and gathered foods. And what's a hunted food? Meat. And what's meat got in it? Lots of things, including saturated fat. So let's say we've been on this planet about two and a half million years. How long have we been eating saturated fat for? And the answer is about two and a half million years. In other words, it is something that we should be quite well adapted to by now. That one every day, it's giving birth now. Oh my God, so it is. Yeah. There it goes out. Oh wow. A, a very good intention from an American president has made cattle farming not quite as healthy as it should be. In the 1930s, he came up with a way to incentivize farmers to carry on farming the land, and that was by subsidizing the price of corn. As a result, the farmers started producing far more corn than was needed in the country and the stockpiles of corn were then sold off cheaply to farmers to use for feeding cattle. They would put them into big feedlots and um, 
just feed them on corn so the cows wouldn't be able to graze on anything that was growing naturally and because um, <clears throat> of the close proximity of how they were being raised you know there'd be a lot of um, of their excrement they'd be standing in it all day long and they'd be far more susceptible to disease so that's why they often are given antibiotics as a preventative measure have you ever been tempted i mean would you not surely you could fit a lot more cattle in here if you raised them in that way we want to do it the natural way. No antibiotics, the pasture animals, the fat is yellow. They on grain feed uh, and feedlots. The fat is white. Uh, the, the housewife see like the nice white looking uh, fat. They not knowing that from pasture it's yellow. It's yellow. Uh, so it's for marketing, yeah. yeah. The, the more ethically you want to farm, the more it's, um, it costs and therefore the, you know, the, the more pressure it puts on your margins. If you are a farmer and you need to make an income out of your farm, you need to have a certain amount of volume uh, that you can supply in order to be economically viable. But then you obviously have to sell it at a certain price that the supermarkets will then dictate. But you, there's no way you can farm something with integrity if you're farming on that scale. Because what are you prepared to do to then have the cheapest steak? Keep your costs down and therefore you can sell your meat cheaper than the guy down the road. Um, and therefore you will get the business from whichever large chain supermarket it happens to be. In my diet, I know that I have lots of water, lots of fruits. Drink like uh, three to four raw eggs every day. Healthy diets, anything without sugar. I believe sugar is like the number one killer in all our food products. What would you say if I told you I was eating a diet that primarily consisted of fat? Um, I would be worried about you. <laughs> I would not believe you. <laughs> I'd say I'm interested. I love fat. <laughs> it's weird because fat's got such a bad connotation to the idea of fat. When people hear fat and they just think really bad foods, but there are certain foods that have good fat, so... No, it can't be. <laughs> okay, then there must be something wrong or something right that you're doing while eating a diet that consists of fat. You know, at one point in my life, I actually believed that saturated fat causes heart disease. I actually believed that the core food group in the diet should be starchy carbohydrate like bread and rice and pasta. Now here's the truth. One thing that's particularly pervasive that I think has much more destructive effects than people really recognize is bread. Uh, it's supposedly the stuff of life but actually for a lot of people um, it's the stuff of nightmares to be honest. A standard healthy breakfast is usually cereal, toast, with fruit juice. And what have you got there? Uh, you have got a stack of sugar, because starch is chains of sugar molecules. This will liberate a lot of sugar into the bloodstream. And the pancreas, in response to that, secretes a hormone called insulin. Insulin drives sugar out of the bloodstream into the cells where it can be burned for fuel. One of the uh, potential problems here is that if you have a lot of sugar being liberated into the system, you get a higher blood sugar, which then can cause the body to secrete a hormone called insulin, which in copious quantities can actually drive blood sugar levels to lower than normal levels. Uh, that can damage the body in a number of ways. First of all, uh, because if you make a lot of insulin over many years, you could eventually become unresponsive to the effects of insulin. So this is basically type 2 diabetes. I think that carbohydrate resistance or carbohydrate intolerance is the major problem that we face and it's estimated that 75% of Americans over 65 years of age have this problem. Now if they persist in eating a high carbohydrate diet, they're going to be in real trouble. Take my own example, my father died of diabetes, my uncle died of diabetes. I'm profoundly carbohydrate resistant, which I only discovered in my 60s. I went and had my blood tests and discovered that I was pre-diabetic. 
and the carbohydrates that I'd been eating, the so-called prudent diet, was just driving me towards diabetes. What's happened in my view in medicine is that we've become so dependent on the pharmaceutical industry and giving out drugs as a treatment, we don't look at the other factors. And my own experience, I now believe that nutrition is, is absolutely central to everything. I've always been very cynical about diets. I've always thought all these fad diets and celebrity diets and so on were uh, a lot of rubbish, to be honest, and been telling my patients that for the last 30 years. And, um, but uh, about 12 months ago, I, uh, I read that my friend Tim Noakes had uh, started using this diet and uh, started promoting uh, the low-carb high fat diet and what great benefit it had been for him and uh, and his patients. So that prompted me to, to uh, start reading and, and I read a book by Gary Torbs called uh, Good Calories, Bad Calories, which uh, again was a life-changing experience and I really um, you know, understood what, uh, what you know, the history of, of this whole thing of why, not only why low carb uh, is scientifically better than, uh, than low fat, but also the politics of how over the years um, the low fat sort of uh, group has sort of become dominant. So it really made me sit up and take notice. And then I thought, well, I better uh, try it for myself. I went pretty low carb for, uh, for three months and, uh, and lost 12 kilograms and um, very easily. I mean, it was enjoyable, it was not difficult. Um, yeah, sure, I had to give up some things, but uh, you replace it with lots of, uh, lots of other things, and uh, it was incredibly rewarding. Is the Ultra Low Down? Yes, it's I'll bring it the spine from the bottom, keeping your curl up. One. I know Donald from late last year, when we met at a Pilates studio, we realized that we've got the same ideas and beliefs as far as nutrition today is concerned. I've got diabetes myself, type 2, and I was put on glucophage, which is one of the most common treatments that you get for diabetes 2. But I just started reading and my knowledge about nutrition, I decided to eat less carbohydrates and I took myself off the medication and I check my sugar almost every fortnight and it's, it's perfect, I feel perfect and um, I don't need, I'm controlling my diabetes without treatment. You can't just think, oh yeah, I can eat the way I want and the medication is going to do it for, or for me. There's no magic bullet, I don't think so. Most of the people who are taking, who are on diabetic medication are being over medicated. And the instant you cut their carbohydrate intake, they're going to require less of the oral antidiabetics or else of insulin. If we could get all diabetics to eat a high-fat, high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet, we would cut their insulin requirements so dramatically that it's been estimated that six pharmaceutical companies would go out of business tomorrow. So that's the problem. The reality is that medicine is a business. And as a doctor, the last thing you want to do is have fewer patients. You can't put everything in the doctor's hands, you know. You also need to, to play a role as far as your own health is concerned, I, I believe. People always like to think they don't have control and they say, yeah, but my mom had diabetes and my dad had diabetes, that's why I've got diabetes. But actually basically what happens is you don't just inherit the genes in your body, but also you inherit the habits. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how's it going? Great. Yeah. I've, um, I'm eating about 200 grams of fat a day. But you don't miss 
Not at all. See, looking at it. <laughs> Go on. We are cutting out a huge amount of food. You are cutting, cutting out a lot of things. You're cutting so, out sugar and wheat. Sugar and wheat. That covers an awful lot of stuff. I, I find it really difficult to think that having bacon, eggs, are, is a healthier in the morning than a bowl of muesli. I, I, I just, I, I really have trouble with that. Industry and commerce and politics is set up to push um, grain, grain products because it's been so heavily subsidized for so long. So, and there, there's a higher margin in those profits. So when you walk into any store... But it's still a lot cheaper, like a lot cheaper. I, I think that this diet really is, it's a middle class rich person's diet. Like I can just see the headlines now, oh, no bread, so let them eat steak. I mean, most people can't afford to eat steak every day. Well, eggs are perfectly <laughs> cheap. You can't just eat eggs. You can eat as many eggs as you want. That's what I'm doing. But I think for most people, it's extreme. But I do think that if people have problems, like you suggest, in their family history, then maybe this they should see what they can do to follow this kind of diet. You don't think you could ever do that extreme? I could if I had to. I could if I had to. Definitely. I just got a text from Gabby saying that my DNA test all is interesting. I got your message and I understand that we have some red flags in the, uh, the DNA report. My father obviously had a, a heart attack, which is why I started this whole process. So is there anything in there? that uh, tells me that I would be a candidate for that? Yes. Okay. So you're high risk of inflammation. IL-6, this is the main gene that's pro-inflammatory. This is very responsive to dietary intake. Your body would be more likely to go into an inflammatory state, and that's a cardiovascular risk factor. Now people are appreciating that inflammation is probably the basis for most of the chronic illnesses that we face. It's diabetes, heart disease, and probably most of the cancers as well. The higher it is, the worse it is for you. And the high carbohydrate diets are highly inflammatory. And no one ever tells you that. If the body is inflamed, sort of the layman's way of describing it is that it's more sticky. So it's more likely for the cholesterol to attach to the blood vessels and, and form plaques. And that's a cardiovascular risk factor. So that doesn't mean that you are going to develop the disease. It means that you have an increased risk. After my dad had his heart attack, am I allowed to say I shit myself? Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, your first phase, if you like, in, in processing something like that is you you care for your dad, you want him to get better. Once it was clear that he was out of the woods, I thought, hang on a minute, you know, this is my dad, and is this coming down the, down the track for me? I remember a new senior's been down there when I was in first year, and it was uh, down at the fringes, but is there anything you can do about it? I mean, I, I look at my dad, and what shocked us was that he was a man who didn't drink, really hadn't put on weight since his footballing days, and we were, we were shocked, and as were a lot of other people. Um, it can occur because people smoke, because people are diabetic, because people have high blood pressure. But the, with, with your dad, it's, it's, it's his makeup, his genetic makeup, which you then obviously inherit. Um, but his cholesterol was higher than um, we would like, and that had to be the main factor. The other intervention we're talking about is, is, is all eggs in one basket. I would like to have objective evidence that that is working. You would easily fit into criteria of somebody who should be on a statin. So what actually works, or what has been shown to work in terms of trials, is you give them a tablet, take the, take the pill, and don't think about it. 
No question, if you were treated in Dublin, you would be treated on a statin and you would be warned that you're at very high risk. I disagree completely. I think that a high value can be completely normal. The reality is cholesterol is one of the most important biochemicals in your body and particularly for in your brain. Someone said it's like if you build a wooden house with nails and the nails are the cholesterol. If you take out all the nails, eventually the whole thing falls apart. Within a cholesterol, there are large particles and small particles. And what they're finding now is that the smaller, denser particles are more likely to cause cardiovascular disease than the larger particles. The small particles are the ones that invade into the arteries and then become oxidized and inflamed and then you get this inflammatory response that causes a heart attack. You cannot treat this condition of so-called high cholesterol without knowing what is the particle size. And to treat it, to put patients on statins without knowing what their particle size is, is malpractice in my view. I'm feeling amazing. The last time I probably felt like this was when I was 17 at my athletics peak. Very strange. I don't know whether that will last, but we'll see as we go through the, the process. But I, I feel like a spring lamb. Pretty consistent, I haven't improved uh, really in the last number of months. I feel lighter, I feel very powerful. Uh, when you're 41, you don't expect to set too many personal best. <laughs> so, yeah, there might be something in this whole fat thing. I'm back again. Hey, it's done all week four. Let's go for the final weigh in. 71.1. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Because most people would think if you increase your fat intake, you'll pick up weight. So, yeah, well, it's definitely, you know, a controversial you know, thing of diet. Because, you know, as most people th would think, if you increase your fat intake, that you'd put on weight. I can feel my jeans falling off. And that's just, just in a couple of weeks. It's amazing. Looking at your graph here, it's very interesting to see that your wasting metabolic rate has gone up. Well, I don't think I've ever seen this kind of response before, and I'm not very familiar with why that would be. <laughs> but it is a very interesting finding, because I mean, one would, re we would expect that your wasting metabolic rate wouldn't really you know, be more efficient or would actually be better in response to a high fat diet. So that is a very interesting finding. Okay, Body fat percentage of 12.9%, almost 1%, you've gone down by 0.7%. Mm. Well, I think I've uh, proven that fat doesn't make you fat. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see what it does to the blood though. Your weight has fluctuated a little bit, but stays pretty stable. But your body fat percentage has come down and your lean muscle mass has increased over, what, just three weeks. Um, and then your resting metabolic rate has increased with, with the start. So is this something you've seen before, baby? Um, this is the first time we've, been, we've actually had the opportunity to do blood tests on someone doing a high fat diet. So no, I haven't haven't seen this before. So it's quite quite exciting. Uh, 
Um, so, if, and if I had to bring it in about half an hour? The uh, tests have come back in, final tests. The LDL cholesterol is high. It's gone up considerably. Um, they're concerned about that. They want to uh, test the particle size to see what's happening at that level. So They seem to be worried, yeah. Yeah, well, we'll get that sample off straight away then. Oh, really? That's okay. Yeah. I'll try and get a blood sample taken. <laughs> Need to do this now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, let's go, so let's go through next door. Okay, come sit here. Thank you. Thanks. I thought I'd seen the last of the needles. One, two. <laughs> okay, so the reason we're doing this blood test is because your total cholesterol and LDL, which is potentially the bad one, went up. Um, so we want to look at the particle size to see whether it was a good LDL or bad LDL. We need to look specifically at your diet and look at the ratios of fat um, to see which what might be you know contributing to this. I don't know if you can sustain the diet like this for for a lifestyle. As long as you have a healthy, balanced diet, I mean, I think that you will be able to sustain much more than going either way extremes with any diet. Hi, Gabby. Very well, how are you? Good, good. So I uh, just got my results for the particle size. The LDL species is in the largest in the usual range seen in humans. So that's the best possible result we could have got. So it eradicates the LDL risk. So we're good shape. Amazing. Yeah. We're going to be around for a while. Thanks very much. It's amazing. But that particle size is brilliant. This is it. Yeah, that's brilliant. So normally when someone saw your cholesterol go from 6.5 to 7.2, they'd say that your health has got much worse and you better get off this diet because you're going to die. But what they haven't done is looked at your particle sizes. And your particle sizes are perfect because all your particles are large. When you go on a high-fat diet, all of a sudden your LDL cholesterol may go up, but it's all in the big particles. Mm -hmm. In contrast, when you go on a high carbohydrate diet, the opposite occurs and you get all the small particles. So that would tell me that I would be completely unconcerned about your, your high cholesterol because it's the safe cholesterol. Blood pressure is probably a much more important risk factor than cholesterol because once you have a high blood pressure, it absolutely damages your arteries. And your blood pressure is almost in your boots. It's 102 over 60 millimeters of mercury, which it can't be lower. And some people, as soon as they cut carbohydrates, their blood pressure can drop very, very rapidly. So the fact that you're on a low carbohydrate diet would be compatible with the fact that your blood pressure is so low. We also measure the level of inflammation and your value is essentially unmeasurable, which means that there's no inflammation in your body which is astonishing. So if you've got no inflammation, that must be very, very helpful. And it's something that hasn't really been discussed, that the high carbohydrate diets are highly inflammatory. So to summarize your test, I have seldom seen someone as healthy as you. The irony is that if people just looked at your LDL cholesterol, your total cholesterol, they say that you're a walking time bomb, you're gonna get a heart attack tomorrow. And that is the opposite to what the evidence shows. And whatever your family history is, it seems that your diet's negated that problem. You are beating your genetics. And it would seem to me that you have an incredible profile. And I would love to have this profile myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great news. <laughs> It's not a case of living forever. It's a case of enjoying every year you have. I think 
generally that's the way the way things have been up until now is that people when people are sick they wait until they're sick to go to the doctor but i do think there's a movement there's there's a change as more and more people are becoming aware of their health ultimately it's governments because governments put us down this route. It was the US government that drove us down this direction. And theoretically, they could change it tomorrow, but as I've indicated, they're not going to. The reality is we're all on our own and we have to find out the solution. Just don't fear fats, start eating fats and see what happens. What we eat influences practically every biological, physiological, biochemical process in the body. And that's, you know, fundamental. It's not a fringe issue. It's absolutely key uh, to both health and well-being meat, fish, nuts, eggs, those in my view should be the core foods, not the base of the current food pyramid that's all full of starchy carbohydrate. No way. Are they boiled eggs? Shocked. Boiled eggs. All is not lost. the Australian cricket team now for almost 12 months. Since I've been on the high fat, low carb diet, my what I eat during the day has changed significantly. Uh, in the morning I'd have bacon and eggs um, and probably some strawberries and blueberries. Normally I'd take the fat off the bacon, um, I'm eating that which I always enjoyed but I thought that was you're supposed to take it off to be a healthy athlete. No, I feel obviously a lot fitter, I feel a lot better, I've lost a lot a lot of weight during time without even trying. My favourite is um, a steak with nice pieces of fat on it to be able to give me some nice flavour. I've increased um, my, my energy. Uh, it's helped me recover better. Um, I'm not out of breath when I'm running between wickets when we play cricket. Around three o'clock in the afternoon, I'll have a snack of some of some nuts or um, again some prosciutto or, or cheese. I'm quite confident in 10 years' time that uh, the you know, Western society will be embracing this uh, low-carb, high-fat concept. But it's going to be a rocky road along the way, and there's going to be a few arguments, I think, and a few debates. But uh, I'm confident that uh, that you know this uh, this is you know this is the truth, and, and this will win out in the end. Some people may say I'm extravagant. I've never heard them. I get a good solid breakfast at a very economical price and that is how I pay my way. I wish you'd pay your electricity bill. Now oh, shut up and say a slogan. Go to work on an egg. <laughs>